going to sing. Everybody stand. We're going to sing page 100. Lift me up above the shadows. Good to be here tonight for prayer meeting. sing the first verse again and uh, let's come together tonight for our prayers so on the first verse one more time lift me up above the shadows plant my feet on higher ground Good to be in the house of the Lord this evening. Good to see all of you. This is our prayer meeting, so we'll take any prayer requests or praise reports at this time. Uh, I do want to remember, as some of you, most of you know, uh, Brother Arnold passed away. Arnold Collins uh, passed away Monday. And so uh, I want to remember Shirley and their family uh, in our prayers. Uh, also on Monday as well, Jamie Parrish's mom passed away uh, too, so we had her funeral today. So. Let's remember them. We, we will uh, uh, repeat it on Sunday, but the funeral will be on Tuesday. Um, and so we'll have uh, 10 a.m. will be visitation. 11 a.m. will be the service. That's, that's next Tuesday for uh, Arnold Collins. So let's remember Shirley and the family in our prayers. Any other requests at this time? Yes. 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 Well, we're at 
Douglas member. Continue remembering Paul. Yes. All right, let's remember her in our prayers. Yes. All right, let's remember Diane, Diane as well. Yes. All right, let's remember Helen. Yes, yes, Jim as well. Yes. All right, let's remember that, that request tonight. Any others? Yes. Yeah. All right. Amen. All right, any unspoken requests? You'll raise your hand. All that will gather around the altar for prayer. Sweet
come for tonight's offering. We're going to take an offering for someone we've never taken one before. How about that? We're going to take it for our sound man upstairs, Ryan Rain. Ryan is here. Yes, give him a hand. He is here every service. He does our website. He puts the messages on the website. He does a lot of work absolutely free. And so I, I think we ought to take him up an offering, and I appreciate and love him. And uh, so everything you give tonight will we'll go to him. Brother Ruiz, would you pray for us? controls these uh, these cameras and he had them on the money bag to see who exactly was giving money in for the so we've got you now we've got you on camera to see who was given what it was all a setup right there no I'm just kidding Bill's actually up there somewhere I think running the cameras all right let's see how good your memory is tonight there are five one chapter books in the Bible we're going to actually ask each section to give us each answer. Ronald cannot speak. Okay, we're giving you the first choice. Give me Jude. Okay, Jude is out. We've been studying Jude in, in the, in, on Sunday nights. Jude is out. That's a one-chapter book. This section, give me one. Yeah, he's out. What's that? Second John, correct. All right, this section. Third John, this section. Philemon, balcony. There's one left. It's in the Old Testament. Shh. It's in the Old Testament. Do you know what it is? Still waiting. It is the book of Obadiah in the Old Testament. So all of you passed except for the balcony. You failed tonight. You had the hardest one though. It was, it was the hardest one. Uh, but there are five one chapter books in the Bible. As we said, four in the New Testament, Jude, 2nd and 3rd John, and Philemon, Obadiah is the only one chapter book in the Old Testament. Um, they are brief books, but they are beneficial books. Someone called them, I love it, someone called them God's special postcards to believers. I like to say they're God's little emails to believers, just small but just packed with a lot of uh, power in them. So tonight... We're going to study what may be the most neglected book in the entire New Testament. That is the book of 2 John. 
So if you have your Bibles, turn to the book of 2 John. We finished up 1 John, and so we're going to move right on in. The, the old apostle, John, he, he's around 100. He, he decides he's going to write a second letter uh, at this time, a, a second little letter, and it's called 2 John. You won't hear many sermons on the book of 2 John. The reason why is there's not a lot of material to preach from. Uh, and that is why we're going to finish this entire book tonight. We're going to finish it tonight. Uh, this little letter. I could only get one message from it. That's okay. Next week, we're going to move and flow right in to 3 John. And even though 3 John is a shorter letter than 2 John, there, there's still a few messages we can get out of that. So we're in 2 John together. Uh, for my fellow OCD friends, there are 298 words in this letter. In these 13 verses, it is the second shortest letter, second shortest book in the Bible. The first, the shortest book of the Bible is 3 John. 249 words if you needed to know. Uh, the writer of that, of course, is John the Beloved as well. John wrote five books. We know he wrote the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and then, of course, the book of Revelation. Uh, he is the second most written author or books wrote the most in our New Testament, second only to Paul. And so this little book of 2 John, it has a special message to us tonight when we read it. Uh, you're going to find out there are two major themes uh, in this little letter of 2 John. And those two themes are, number one, love. Does that surprise anyone tonight? That one of his themes is love and the second theme is truth. And you're going to see this right away in the first three verses of 2 John. So let's stand together. Let's read these first three verses together. Again, we're going to be looking through the whole uh, letter tonight. But look at the first three verses and see if you can pick out these two themes that are there. He says in verse 1, the elder, that is John talking about himself. The elder unto the elect lady and her children, here it is, whom I love in the what? In the truth, and not I only, but also all they that have known the truth. For the truth's sake, which dwelleth in us, shall be with us forever. Grace be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father, from the Lord Jesus Christ, and then he hammers it again, the Son of the Father in truth and in Love God, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for each and every one who've made it out to be in your house tonight. Lord, we do want to lift up uh, the Collins family tonight. Lord, we want to lift up Shirley and their family and the parish family. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would just be with them, comfort them at this time. Be with those here tonight who couldn't be with us, who are sick on beds of affliction. Just watch over us for a few moments, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Now, there is very little debate about who the elder is here. Almost everyone you read or everyone that you can study, they all agree this writer is John. And when he calls himself an elder, understand, he is using one of the terms to describe a pastor of a local congregation. Many think that John died on the Isle of Patmos. That is not true. After Domitian, who was the Roman emperor, who exiled him to the Isle of Patmos, after Domitian died... History writers tell us that some of John's followers went to the Isle of Patmos and rescued him. What would that would have been like for John? I mean, every day he looks out over the sea and sees nothing. And all of a sudden he sees a boat coming his way to bring him back home. And so they rescued him. And that, of course, is how the book of Revelation made its way back to land and was distributed accordingly. As we said, the word elder is a word that describes a pastor of a local congregation. Most believe John in his latter days was the pastor of a congregation in the city of Ephesus. Now Leland and Lisa and I, we went there. We went to Ephesus and you can go to the place they believe that John is buried uh, there in Ephesus. So here is John the elder, the beloved pastor, and he's writing this letter. And although there's little debate about who the elder is here, John, there is much debate and difference of opinion about the person to whom John is writing. What does John mean 
To whom is John writing when he says, unto the elect lady? And then he adds this, and her children. Now there are two basic views. I'm going to give you the wrong one first. This is the more popular belief, but I just don't go with it. Your Bible might even, my Bible says it. This is who John's writing to. One is that John is writing to a local church. That the church to who John is writing this letter is called the elect lady. If you look down in verse 13, John ends by saying, The children of thy elect sister greet thee. So some go along and say John is referring here to their sister church and is sending greetings from one church to another church. The only problem with this view is that the church is never pictured in the Bible as having children. You see, there are no children of the church. When you receive Jesus as your Savior, you are born into a family of God and you become a child, not of the church, become a child of God. Now, the second view, which I think is the correct view, I do, is that John's actually writing to a Christian lady. That, that he's writing a lady he has known or, or he's heard about, and John knows her sister, who is also a believer, and he's met some of the children of this elect lady. And so he's writing this godly woman a letter. He's talking to her about some things which he has discovered. You'll notice he says in verse 4, I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth as we have received a commandment from the Father. So somewhere along the way, John, the pastor, the elder, had run into some of the children of this sweet Christian lady. So John, seeing their devotion to the Lord, seeing them grow and mature in the things of God, he's just grateful. And now he writes this mother a letter commending her for the way she's raised her children. Now, if this is true, if this is true that this is a woman, a little woman he's writing to, this is the only book in the entire Bible which is specifically addressed to a woman. One scholar said Philemon is the only book in the Bible addressed to a layman. Second John is the only book in the Bible addressed to a lady. And so here, I believe, is a, a Christian mother who has taught her children the truth and she has taught them what love is all about and they're growing and they're maturing in the things of God. And so John is refreshed and John is blessed as he sees these young people growing up in the Lord. So John is just simply commending here this mother who has succeeded in raising her children for Christ. As I stated earlier, John's going to deal with Two words which are very important in these verses. If you look down through the first four verses of this letter, you will see that he uses the word truth five different times. He says in verse 1, whom I love in the truth. Then he says later in verse 1, all those who have known the truth. Verse 2, for truth's sake. Verse 3, at the end, in truth and love. In verse 4, thy children walking in truth. Truth, Folks, we need more than ever than people to be truthful today in their Christian walk. And he says, thy children are walking in truth. And that doesn't mean literal walking. It means your lifestyle, your behavior, your daily life as a Christian. Someone said, what could we find out about you if we secretly followed you each and every day as you walked the life of a Christian? John says, I saw your children walking in truth. So what is the characteristic of a person whose life is filled with God's truth? Well, John tells us in verse number 5, he says, And now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, what do you think he's going to write? <laughs> that we love one another. See, what John's trying to get across to this lady here, he said, I saw your children, and they were living in truth. And so he wants her to understand what this commandment is. He said, listen, it's not anything new. It's not a new commandment. He says, but the commandment here is to love one another. Again, does this surprise anyone here tonight that this is John saying these words? I, I thought, how many of you would like to have sat under John as a pastor as he preached? How many believe most of his sermons would have been on love? It's pretty humorous as we continue reading. Where is John getting this whole idea of love? Where is he getting this whole idea of this being not a new commandment? 
Well, turn back with me to John 13. We did this one other time when we were looking in 1 John. When John kept using, using the word little children, we go back and we see Jesus use that same word. Well, now I want you to look and see where John got this phrase about this loving one another not being a new commandment. Back in John 13, we see Jesus is with his disciples. Just before he's going to the cross, he's in the upper room and he's sharing with them and he wants them to, what he wants them to do and the kind of lifestyle he wants them to live. And in John 13, I want you to look down in verse number 34. Look what Jesus says. Look at, the, look at the phrase. Look at the word usage here. See if it sounds familiar. Jesus says, A new commandment I give unto you that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Now when Jesus gave this here in John chapter 13, can you remember what has just happened? It's pretty humorous. The disciples are arguing over who's the greatest. <laughs> Jesus is a day away from dying on the cross. He has tutored these 12 men for over three years. And the night before his crucifixion, they are arguing who is the greatest amongst them. Can't you see Jesus just going, oh, these guys. I mean, these, these disciples, they were so mad at one another that when it came time to wash each other's feet, not a one of them would humble themselves and do it. They would rather eat that last supper with dirty, muddy feet. By the way, they would lean over so that person's feet are in your face. They would rather do that than humbly showing love towards one another. So in the midst of that kind of environment, Jesus says, guys, love one another. So back to 2 John very quickly. John also tells us the same thing, to love one another. You know, there are all kinds of definitions of love today. Everywhere you turn, you hear about love. There are songs today written about love and poetry written about love. On the television, you see things that are trying to teach our kids about love. This world thinks they have love all figured out, but this world has no idea what true love really is. But in 2 John, I want you to notice, in verse 6, John tells us what love is. Verse 6, watch this. He says, and this is love. What is it, John? That we walk after his commandments. You see that? John says real love is obedience. Real love is obeying the Lord. Real love is walking in truth and walking in righteousness. Listen, love is not an emotion. You can't say I just fell out of love. No, love is a choice. I choose to love someone. I choose to obey God and his commandments. What did Jesus say? If you love me, keep my commandments. So we see, first of all, truth and love, John tells it, it must be practiced. But secondly, he warns us and says, and be careful because truth and love may be perverted. Look what he says in verse number 7. For many deceivers are entered into the world. That word, that word deceiver is a word that literally means a wandering teacher. Now I hope that sounds familiar to you. If you were here Sunday night, listen to what Jude says in verse 13 about the apostate teacher. He says, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars. It's the same concept, the wandering teacher. In those days, there were many of these wandering vagabonds. They would go place to place without any settled home. And they were wandering teachers, and they 
popped up everywhere and they were teaching all kinds of false doctrines. We come across one, I believe it's in Acts chapter 12. There were seven sons of Sceva. These men, they did not know who Christ was, but they watched and saw the apostle Paul casting out demons in the name of Jesus. And so these wandering teachers decided, hey, we want to cast out demons too. So they set up a little traveling circus. They would go town to town. And they show up at Ephesus. And they set up and they find this demon-possessed man. And they gather everybody in. No doubt they made them pay a price to watch what they were about to do. And they said this. They said, we abjure you or we cast you out in the name of Jesus who this guy Paul preaches about. Did they have a relationship with Christ? They didn't even know who he was. We saw this guy Paul casting out demons in the name of Jesus. We're casting out demons in the name of Jesus this Paul preaches about. And then this demon says one of the most humiliating things, really hurts their self-esteem. He says, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Now if that wasn't bad enough, guess what? They cast out the demon. The only problem is the demon jumped on them and beat them to a pulp. Uh, that would have been a show I'd have liked to have seen, wouldn't you? <laughs> Ripped all of their clothes off. The Bible says, you, you know, you hope, you know, maybe nobody saw it happen. You know what the Bible says? That all of Ephesus saw these men running around naked for their lives. That's what he's talking about, these wandering teachers, these wandering vagabonds. They popped up everywhere, and they were just teaching all kinds of false doctrine. So John's going to take a page out of, of Jude, and he's going to deal with this problem head on. He, he says there's a lot of deceivers in this world, and so here's how you spot a deceiver. Here's how you spot a perverter of the truth. Here's how you find and spot a false teacher. Jude taught us this Sunday night how, how he would spot them. Now John tells us. And he says in verse 7, For many deceivers are entered into the world. Here it is, notice. Who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. He says this is a deceiver and an antichrist. So right away, let me just tell you where we're at. All Jehovah's Witnesses are deceivers. They do not believe Jesus Christ came in the flesh. And so there were those who were teaching Jesus Christ was not really a person. We talked about this in 1 John. They were called Gnostics. They believed that the body was evil, that the flesh was evil. Therefore, God could not have taken up a body of flesh, that God would not taint himself with a human body. So they said, Jesus is not a real person. He's a phantom of some sort. Others said this. Jesus was flesh and blood man, and the divine Christ inhabited him while he walked the earth. But then when he went to the cross at the point of death, the divine Christ deserted him, and Jesus Christ died a mere man. Now, you can't be saved if that's the case. So do you see what that does to the Christian faith? That God has not come in the flesh? I mean, the first chapter of the Gospel of John, what did John say very plainly? That the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus was 100% God. He was 100% man. And anyone who tampers with the deity of Jesus Christ, anyone who denies that Christ has come in the flesh as the Savior of the world, John says, get away from them. They are deceivers. They are anti-Christ. Then he continues to warn us in verse 9. He says, Whosoever transgresseth. That, those words means go beyond. And what John is talking about is those people who go beyond the doctrine of Christ. They don't stop with the doctrine of Christ. They go beyond it. They add to it. And understand, that's the characteristic of every cult on this earth. They all will go beyond the doctrines of the word of God. You understand everything we have in here? When, when John gets to the end and says, Amen, that closed the canon of Scripture. Nothing else needed to be added to the Word of God. That's where the cult comes in. Every cult claims to have some new information. The Mormons, they have a, a new book. 
that goes along with the Bible that was hidden for all these years and Joseph Smith found it and, and wrote it. Isn't it interesting? A lot of the writing in that Book of Mormon, a lot of it were plagiarized right from the, the Book of Isaiah. Word for word. And he said, oh no, this was all mine. And they say, no, there's this new book. It finishes where the Bible leaves off. We have a, a new revelation. Some new prophet, some new leader has just discovered new things to conclude the teachings of Jesus. Yet Jesus said, I'm the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and what? And the end. It ends with him. But when you go beyond the teachings of God's word, you go beyond what Jesus had to say about it, you've simply just gone too far. So John says in the middle of verse 9 that if you abideth not in the doctrine of Christ... You hath not God. It's pretty blunt, isn't it? You're not saved. You're not saved. You need to be born again. If you meet a Jehovah's Witness, you meet a Mormon, they're not saved. They need to be born again. Now John will close by showing us how they spread this doctrine. See if this sounds familiar. Verse 10, if there come any unto you. How many know these cults go house to house to house to house? One preacher said this, and I agree. He said, most of these cults are wrong in their head, but they're right in their feet. Yeah. Amen. The Bible teaches we ought to go visit. We ought to go house to house. That is normal Christianity. But the cults are doing a way better job than God's own children are. So what are you going to do when you hear, hey, I'd like to... Talk to you about. So I, I got some information here. I want you. What, what are you, you going to do? Here's what John says to do. Now watch this. Verse 10. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, talking about the doctrine of Christ, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. For he that biddeth him Godspeed is a partaker. Of his evil deeds. You say, boy, that John, he's a mean fella. He, he couldn't write a book on how to get along with friends and how to influence people at all. I mean, that's so harsh. That's so unloving. I thought John was called the apostle of love. You know, there's a story about the apostle John. It's not recorded in the word of God, but early writers wrote it. And they said there was a heretic in John's day, a cultist. He was a false teacher by the name of Serentheus. And one day John, think of him, in his old age, nearing 100, in a bathhouse. And Serentheus walked in. And they said immediately John jumped out of the water, put a towel on quickly, grabbed his clothes, and took off running. Now imagine a 100-year-old man running with a towel on. And they said while he's running away, he said, Let us hurry from this house, lest it fall on us. For Serentheus, the enemy of truth, has come. Yeah. You say, but that's, that's mean. That's unloving. Well, why can't we let them into our home? Ah, no. Suppose you have a, a little boy or girl at your house. Right. One day somebody knocks on your door and when you open, a man's standing there. He says, hey, I understand you have, a, you have a little boy in there. Yeah, I do. Well, listen, I'm a pedophile. Can I come into your house? Would that be okay? What well, what would you do, Mom? Dad? Don't you love the sinner and hate the sin? You would never allow something like that to come into your house because of what might happen to your family. Listen, you are to protect your family. You are to guard your home. You don't have to be rude. You don't have to be impolite. You don't have to be inconsiderate. But John says, don't you dare let them come into your house. I thought, what would happen every time one of those false cults who deny the word of God came to your house? And, and, and what if everyone just lovingly said, I'm sorry, but listen, we believe the word of God. That Jesus Christ is the son of God and has come in the flesh. And I don't want you to come in. I thought, what would happen if they got about a hundred doors of that every single day? Don't you think that might make them start wondering, hey, maybe we're wrong. But John said, don't even tell them Godspeed. Let them go. 
And then he ends his letter by saying this, verse 12, look at me close. It says, having many things to write unto you, I would not write with paper and ink, but I trust to come to you and speak face to face, that our joy may be full. Thy children of thy elect sister greet thee. Amen. So John says, I don't want to write any more letters. I'd rather see you face to face. What's amazing to me, this is an old man saying this. I don't want to write anymore. I'd rather travel and see you face to face. So I say to you tonight, if you want to know the truth, we know this. The truth is Jesus Christ died on the cross. The truth is Jesus shed his blood for you. The truth is Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. You can't work your way to heaven. And if you repent of your sin and, and invite personally Jesus into your life, you will be saved. That is the truth. Now we must share that with people in love. I love the story about a Muslim in Africa. He became a Christian and some of his friends asked him, why have you done such a thing? And he answered, well, it's like this. Suppose you were going down the road and suddenly the road forked in two directions. You didn't know which way to go and there at the fork were two men. One dead and one alive. Which one would you ask to show you the right way? There's a lot of false religions out there. And every one of their leaders are dead. We can go to their tombs. But there's only one we can go to today that on the door it says, He is not here, for He is risen. And He's the one that we look to to show us the way. Amen? As we stand together, heads bowed and eyes closed, we get a song of invitation. You're here tonight. You have a need in your life. You have a burden, maybe a prayer request. You want to be remembered in prayer. Would you just slip up your hand? I know there are many. Bless all the hands here tonight. God knows each and every heart, each and everything that you're going through. I wonder if you have a friend or a loved one, an acquaintance, a neighbor, and they're unsaved and they're following these false cults. They're following a dead leader. They're following someone who is no longer alive and cannot show them the way, but they're in these cults and they're hooked in these cults and they're trapped in these cults. I wonder tonight if you have anyone in your life that you can think of that needs prayer tonight, that is chained in bondage in these cults. Would you just raise your hand by saying, pray for me. I have friends and relatives and family. Bless all the hands here tonight. I think we all do. God, we love you. We thank you for your word. Thank you for how blunt it is, how in our face it is, but the truth that it is, as John said, in truth and in love. So God, I pray for each and every one here tonight who raised their hands, so many who have needs, others who raise their hands, who have loved ones who are trapped in these false cults. Lord, I pray that they would see the light, see the truth. Help us to do our part to show them the way to a everlasting salvation through Jesus Christ. Now, Lord, it's a, the altar time. If anyone needs to pray, if any need to come, I pray that they would, for it's in Jesus' name. Amen. As we sing, if you need to pray. Page 81. Just as I am.
tonight and uh, <clears throat> want to remember of course uh, all those who are sick uh, the Goody family Miss Ann brother Eddie uh, different ones having tests so let's remember all them tonight all right let's be dismissed in prayer any other announcements that I'm not remembering all right come back on Sunday we'll see you Sunday morning for another good time in the Lord Calvin would you dismiss us in prayer